Ryan Noah, PGY4. Um, I guess I'll, I'll touch on that very briefly as well. Um, so just a very quick wrap up since I think we're short on time. So just a quick summary. I want to first go over the article quickly. This is our JAMA article looking at uncomplicated appendicitis. They looked at success, treatment success, and disability days uh, comparing IV antibiotics to um, operative management, so non-operative compared to operative management, not randomized, but controlled. So it was a multi-site, non-randomized, prospective patient choice, which I don't think I've ever seen before observational trial. And it was very specifically uncomplicated appendicitis confirmed by imaging. And they compared non-operative antibiotics group with operative management. And they looked at the disability days of the child at one year at the primary outcome and the success rate of the non-operative management at one year. They have a million secondary outcomes. And if you actually look at their conclusions, a lot of their conclusions are based on the secondary outcomes, which I think Dr. Z kind of touched upon. Any secondary outcome is purely hypothesis driven and should not be used to actually make a conclusion anyway. And so they probably go a little far in that. Uh, inclusion criteria is you're seven to 17 and you have appendicitis um, that's not complicated. Exclusion criteria is anybody with anything that makes it anything close to complicated appendicitis. Um, I think a lot of the things here, you would, if you had a patient with these things, you'd say they really don't even, if they don't have these things, the patients that are included are the healthiest of the healthiest. And I think everybody I've had who has appendicitis would be excluded from this patient population almost anyway. Success. Um, and this is, you know, we'll talk about why some of the success is an issue as well, because it's not blinded, because it's not a double blind RCT. Um, so they kind of had this big giant working group. Surgeons wanted five days of a difference in disability days. The consensus group wanted three days. And this is kind of what Dr. Sinnott was talking about, how they had these two different numbers for each of their success rates and how they tried to then argue that though it didn't meet what their um, criteria was, that they were actually still successful because the working group so voted against it, the patients and primary care and emergency medicine physicians actually wanted this other criteria, the, the lesser, the lower threshold criteria of the 50% success rate and three days of decrease in disability days. So I know you can't see that table very well. It's their results from their primary outcome. So actually what Dr. Sinnott was saying that they didn't include the people lost to follow up. They actually did use them in their denominator, but they did the opposite of what Dr. Sinnott was saying they should have done. And they did a best case analysis and actually included all the lost to follow up as negative, as like successful non-operative management cases, which is how they get to the 66.2%. And there was six, and then they did the second analysis, a post hoc analysis that they didn't mention in their um, initial paper defining it or in their registration, where they took out these 16 people who, after kind of choosing to go into the non operative management, so this is the crossover and non intention to treat analysis essentially here, where they said, okay, these people said we actually changed our mind we actually want to get surgery. And they said, oh, that's 70.2%. That actually meets the surgeon's threshold even of success. So they're like really trying to push this was successful for non-operative management. So checklist. Number one, it's actually not included in the check checklist, but is it registered and does it match the registry? I don't think we mentioned this at all. They actually were registered. And they noted in the paper itself that they actually made one major difference in the way that they did their study compared to the registration, which was, I think Dr. Sinner pointed out, 40, if they were aiming for 40% of people would choose non-operative management, 60% would choose operative management, and it ended up being more like 30, 70. And so they changed some of their follow-up protocols to figure out and to extend the number of people they were recruiting. Um, 
And so then because of the loss of the file, they've also kind of increased these incentives that weren't mentioned in any of the supplements, their initial paper, defining what the, what the study would be, or in this paper. And they also expanded to contacting the primary care providers, which kind of goes into some of the loss of the follow-up stuff. So back to the checklist, where do they fail? Well, number one, it wasn't randomized. Number two, there's no blinding. They do this like post hoc 16 are intention to treat, but then they pull them out and do like for protocol. Um, they do incentives are noted, but never defined. And a lot of their conclusions are based on secondary outcome, which again, not supposed to do. So there's a whole bunch of biases in clinical research. And this one suffers from like everything that Dr. Center and Dr. Z mentioned. Um, so selection bias, we're gonna mention it a little bit more. It's already touched upon a bunch. Observer bias, I don't think we really mentioned that, but when you don't blind it, the people who are making the decisions of whether something is successful or not is really important as well. Um, all these patients are admitted to the surgical service. They're all aware that the patient's getting non-operative management or operative management. Surgeons like to cut. That's why they went into surgery. They clearly just from the working group decisions were more wanting to do more, were wanting to do more surgeries. So just in the hospital failures, when they say that somebody, you know, opted to switch with that because, and that counted, that should have counted as a failure. And then they did their post-hoc analysis, not counting it as a failure. You know, is the surgery resident every day going, oh my God, your stomach, that hurts more. Are they in some way influencing the outcome? Um, 16 clinically worsened, but they don't really say how they worsened. You know, one day of antibiotics, you don't necessarily expect somebody to be cured right away. And 16 did not improve. Who knows what this means? Again, it's the surgery resident attending who has their own bias that they're putting on to the patient and their presentation. And then what they don't give really the discharge criteria for the sick that didn't. So that's kind of observer bias. There's an issue with who's actually reporting the data and then attrition bias, which we talked a lot about. So follow-up, this has been the big issue that Dr. Zatachi talked about and Dr. Sinner talked about. So just looking at the groups, I'm sure none of you went through it, but they include these supplements that are pretty helpful. And one of the supplements goes over the differences in the groups that were follow-up. Um, as you can see on, on the left, it's all the people who were lost. And on the right, it's the people who had complete follow-up. So in their loss of follow-up, only 75% of them, 74.7% of them were white. Um, and as you can see, 8.1 can compare to six. It's biased in who's also, and this adds into that selection bias that Dr. Zatachi talked about, that they're not equally, the two groups aren't equally being lost to follow up. Some people are kind of choosing or in some way selectively being lost to follow up. And the type of insurance they have, and I think this is really important for us, um, people with Medicaid were more likely to be lost to follow up. People with private insurance were less likely to be lost to follow up relative to their cohort. So how applicable is this to us? So what's the big deal? Selection bias and attrition bias, it really reduces the power of the study, reduces the generalizability, and it's how they're treated. I kind of mentioned this before. They did a best case scenario analysis where they said everybody who was lost to follow-up, but they didn't have complete data. They said, well, they didn't have appendicitis, even if, who knows? And so if you actually include those 41 people who didn't have complete follow-up, they it comes out to something closer to 56% that people failed or, or had successful treatment. So that's a pretty big number. I don't think most of us would do much on 56% um, as like a treatment choice. That's something to think about. So it really does weaken our conclusions when you lose um, that many people. As Dr. Zatachi said, there's not great studies on this, but less than 5% is considered really good. This is greater than 20%. And greater than 20% is 
terrible and it certainly shouldn't be greater than the effect size and there's like a gray area in between there was it too much was it good um but you want to aim for less than five percent and smaller than the effect size so the problem with a non-randomized trial and then just even for our own use for our own patient population is it generalizable and is it applicable as, we were as Dr. Sinner mentioned, this is the, the split in the selection bias and who went into each group. He already covered it, so I'll skip there. There's also a huge difference in access to insurance and income. Um, this is just tons of extraneous data they're getting, but it shows that there are differences in who's going into each group. And do you think this is applicable to our population? No, these are predominantly white, wealthy, areas in the Midwest, and it's nothing like our patient population or hospital. So I don't think this should probably change what you do, but, you know, 50%, some people might really find a benefit. Um, if you want your child to go to some trip somewhere and you just need those few days, and you know that you can get them into some situation where they'll be back and have good follow-up, it's something to offer patients based on preference, but it's not really a great treatment. And I don't think it's something that this study will change what we're doing. And that's kind of it. Thank you. Uh, any questions, comments? I have one question. Yeah. So I guess like one of the red flags in the paper was like that they said that they were powered to 10% loss of follow-up. And then they were like, well, guess what we like lost like 20 to 30. But I was thinking, like, and so, like, in my mind, I'm like, well, something is wrong already. But I guess if they had said that they, if we talked about, like, the standard, like, five to ten expected, what if, what if they had said we, like, powered our study for, like, a 20% loss of follow-up? Would the fact that they anticipated a 20% loss of follow-up be a red flag in and of itself? Or, like, how would you, or would that, like... I don't, I don't know if, like, if you say we plan for a 20% loss of follow-up, you could you know, cite other similar studies of saying in studies like this that follow patients for this period of time, it is expected to get a 20% loss of follow-up, but I don't, it doesn't strengthen the results. And even some of the things they did to try and improve that loss of follow-up. So they reached out to primary care physicians to say, oh, did this person have treatment failure? And that's why there's a, a discrepancy between patient, patient reported outcomes, that they have complete outcomes and that they have medically reported outcomes that they say are complete, but maybe you stopped going to the doctor, you left the hospital system, you moved somewhere else. And so when they contact their primary care doctor and says, oh yeah, no, they didn't have a... Yeah, I think that's more globally, like outside of the... It's still a bad study. It's still a bad study. <laughs> yeah, I think it's more... I think, I think it's just... 20% is bad no matter what. I don't want to do a bad study to begin with. It's still a bad study, right? So that, that's your question, right? So it's more like with 20%, like anticipating, a, yeah, exactly. Like, would say, like, would yeah, somebody saying, I have to pay to follow up. There's a lot of follow up of 20% going to the stuff. Okay. Yeah, have better systems to get yeah. the follow up. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. In general, always when you do sample size analysis, you add a certain percentage for, for people who withdraw from the study, who were lost to follow up. So when you do that, it addresses the fact that lost to follow up might have one year power but it doesn't address any of the other issues that are associated with loss to follow-up. You still should do the sensitivity now. You're right. That's very good job, thank you. The only thing I really liked about the paper was that it does give possibility. It wasn't a good paper, I agree, but it's something to keep in mind. Say you're working in Haiti and you don't have a surgeon, that you maybe can get away with treating it non-operatively and following them up if you can get good follow-up. So I, I agree that you needed you would need a better randomized control to look at therapy. But it, as Dr. Z said, these kind of studies can be used to come up with other possibilities.